Section 16 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 16. The Argonauts. Part 1. How the Centaur Trained the Heroes on Pelion. I have told you of a hero who fought with wild beasts and with wild men. But now I have a tale of heroes who sailed away into a distant land to win themselves renown forever in the adventure of the Golden Fleece. Whither they sailed, my children, I cannot clearly tell. It all happened long ago, so long that it has all grown dim, like a dream which you dreamed last year. And why they went, I cannot tell. Some say that it was to win gold. It may be so. But the noblest deeds which have been done on earth have not been done for gold. It was not for the sake of gold that the Lord came down and died, and the apostles went out to preach the good news in all lands. The Spartans looked for no reward in money when they fought and died at Thermopylae and Socrates the wise asked no pay from his countrymen, but lived poor and barefoot all his days, only caring to make men good. And there are heroes in our days also, who do noble deeds, but not for gold. Our discoverers did not go to make themselves rich, when they sailed out one after another into the dreary frozen seas, nor did the ladies who went out last year to drudge in the hospitals of the East, making themselves poor, that they might be rich in noble works. And young men, too, whom you know, children, and some of them your own kin, did not say to themselves, How much money shall I earn, when they went out to the war, leaving wealth and comfort and a pleasant home and all that money can give, to face hunger and thirst, and wounds, and death, that they might fight for their country and their queen. No, children, there is a better thing on earth than wealth, a better thing than life itself, and that is to have done something before you die, for which good men may honor you, and God your Father smile upon your work. Therefore we will believe, why should we not, of these same Argonauts of old, that they too were noble men, who planned and did a noble deed, and that therefore their fame has lived, and been told in story and in song, mixed up, no doubt, with dreams and fables, yet true and right at heart. So we will honor these old Argonauts, and listen to their story as it stands, and we will try to be like them, each of us in our place, for each of us has a golden fleece to seek, and a wild sea to sail over ere we reach it, and dragons to fight ere it be ours. And what was that first golden fleece? I do not know, nor care. The old Hellenes said that it hung in Colchis, which we call the Circassian coast, nailed to a beech tree in the war god's wood, and that it was the fleece of the wondrous ram, who bore Phrixus and Hell across the Euxin Sea. For Phrixus and Hell were the children of the cloud-nymph, and of Athamas, the Minuan king. And when a famine came upon the land, their cruel stepmother, I know, wished to kill them, that her own children might reign, and said that they must be sacrificed on an altar to turn away the anger of the gods. So the poor children were brought to the altar, and the priest stood ready with his knife, when, out of the clouds, came the golden ram, and took them on his back and vanished. Then madness came upon that foolish king Athamas, and ruin upon Ino and her children. For Athamas killed one of them in his fury, and Ino fled from him with the other in her arms, and leaped from a cliff into the sea, and was changed into a dolphin, such as you have seen, which wanders over the waves forever sighing, 
with its little one clasped to its breast. But the people drove out King Athamas, because he had killed his child, and he roamed about in his misery, till he came to the oracle in Delphi. And the oracle told him that he must wander for his sin, till the wild beasts should feast him as their guest. So he went on in hunger and sorrow for many a weary day, till he saw a pack of wolves. The wolves were tearing a sheep, but when they saw Athamas, they fled, and left the sheep for him, and he ate of it, and then he knew that the oracle was fulfilled at last. So he wandered no more, but settled, and built a town, and became a king again. But the ram carried the two children far away, over land and sea, till he came to the Thracian Chersonese, and there hell fell into the sea. So those narrow straits are called Hellespont, after her, and they bear that name until this day. Then the ram flew on with Phrixus to the northeast across the sea, which we call the Black Sea now, but the Hellenes called it Euxin. And at last, they say, he stopped at Colchis, on the steep Circassian coast, and there Phrixus married Chalciope, the daughter of Aetes the king and offered the ram in sacrifice, and Aetes nailed the ram's fleece to a beech in the grove of Ares the war-god. And after a while Phrixus died and was buried, but his spirit had no rest, for he was buried far from his native land and the pleasant hills of Hellas. So he came in dreams to the heroes of the Minuai, and called sadly by their beds, Come and set my spirit free, that I may go home to my fathers and to my kinsfolk and the pleasant Minuan land. And they asked, How shall we set your spirit free? You must sail over the sea to Colchis and bring home the golden fleece, and then my spirit will come back with it, and I shall sleep with my fathers and have rest. He came thus, and called to them often. But when they woke, they looked at each other and said, Who dare sail to Colchis, or bring home the golden fleece? And in all the country none was brave enough to try it, for the man and the time were not come. Phrixus had a cousin called Eson, who was king in Iolcus by the sea. There he ruled over the rich Minuan heroes, as Athamas his uncle, ruled in Boeotia, and, like Athamas, he was an unhappy man. For he had a stepbrother named Peleus, of whom some said that he was a nymph's son, and there were dark and sad tales about his birth. When he was a babe, he was cast out on the mountains, and a wild mare came by and kicked him. But a shepherd, passing, found the baby, with its face all blackened by the blow, and took him home, and called him Peleus, because his face was bruised and black. And he grew up fierce and lawless, and did many a fearful deed, and at last he drove out Eson, his stepbrother, and then his own brother Neleus, and took the kingdom to himself, and ruled over the rich Minuan heroes in Iolcus by the sea. And Eson, when he was driven out, went sadly away out of the town, leading his little son by the hand, and he said to himself, I must hide the child in the mountains, or Peleus will surely kill him because he is the heir. So he went up from the sea, across the valley, through the vineyards and the olive groves, and across the torrent of Anoros, toward Pelion, the ancient mountain, whose brows are white with snow. He went up, and up into the mountain over marsh and crag, and down, till the boy was tired and footsore, and Eason had to bear him in his arms, till he came to the mouth of a lonely cave at the foot of a mighty cliff. Above the cliff the snow wreaths hung, dripping and cracking in the sun, but at its foot around the cave's mouth grew all fair flowers and herbs, as if in a garden, ranged in order each sort by itself. 
There they grew gaily in the sunshine, and the spray of the torrent from above, while from the cave came the sound of music and a man's voice singing to the harp. Then Eason put down the lad and whispered, Fear not, but go in, and whomsoever you shall find, lay your hands upon his knees and say, In the name of Zeus the father of gods and men, I am your guest from this day forth. Then the lad went in without trembling, for he too was a hero's son. But when he was within, he stopped in wonder to listen to that magic song. And there he saw the singer, lying upon bearskins and fragrant boughs, Chiron, the ancient centaur, the wisest of all things beneath the sky. Down to the waist he was a man, but below he was a noble horse. His white hair rolled down over his broad shoulders, and his white beard over his broad brown chest, and his eyes were wise and mild, and his forehead like a mountain wall. And in his hands he held a harp of gold, and struck it with a golden key, and as he struck he sang till his eyes glittered and filled all the cave with light. And he sang of the birth of time, and of the heavens and the dancing stars, and of the ocean and the ether and the fire and the shaping of the wondrous earth, and he sang of the treasures of the hills and the hidden jewels of the mine, and the veins of fire and metal, and the virtues of all healing herbs, and of the speech of birds, and of prophecy, and of hidden things to come. Then he sang of health, and strength, and manhood, and of valiant heart, and of music, and hunting, and wrestling, and all the games which heroes love, and of travel, and wars, and sieges, and a noble death in fight. And then he sang of peace and plenty, and of equal justice in the land. And as he sang, the boy listened wide-eyed and forgot his errand in the song. And, at last, old Chiron was silent, and called the lad with a soft voice. And the lad ran trembling to him, and would have laid his hands upon his knees. But Chiron smiled, and said, Call hither your friend Aeson, for I know you, and all that has befallen, and saw you both afar in the valley, even before you left the town. Then Aeson came in sadly, and Chiron asked him, Why came you not yourself to me, Aeson the Aeolid? And Aeson said, I thought Chiron will pity the lad if he sees him come alone, and I wished to try whether he was fearless and dare venture like a hero's son. But now I entreat you by Father Zeus, let the boy be your guest till better times, and train him among the sons of the heroes, that he may avenge his father's house. Then Chiron smiled, and drew the lad to him, and laid his hand upon his golden locks, and said, Are you afraid of my horse's hoofs, fair boy, or will you be my pupil from this day? I would gladly have horses' hoofs like you if I could sing such songs as yours. And Chiron laughed and said, Sit here by me till sundown, when your playfellows will come home, and you shall learn like them to be a king, worthy to rule over gallant men. Then he turned to Eason and said, Go back in peace, and bend before the storm like a prudent man. This boy shall not cross the Anoros again, till he has become a glory to you and to the house of Aeolus. And Aeson wept over his son and went away. But the boy did not weep, so full was his fancy of that strange cave and the centaur and his song and the playfellows whom he was to see. Then Chiron put the lyre into his hands, and taught him how to play it, till the sun sank low behind the cliff, 
and a shout was heard outside. And then in came the sons of the heroes, Aeneas and Heracles and Peleus and many another mighty name. And great Chiron leapt up joyfully, and his hooves made the cave resound, as they shouted, Come out, Father Chiron, come out and see our game. And one cried, I have killed two deer, and another, I took a wild cat among the crags, and Heracles dragged a wild goat after him by its horns, for he was as huge as a mountain crag, and Caeneus carried a bear cub under each arm, and laughed when they scratched and bit, for neither tooth nor steel could wound him. And Chiron praised them all, each according to his deserts. Only one walked apart and silent, Asclepius the too wise child, with his bosom full of herbs and flowers, and round his wrist a spotted snake. He came with downcast eyes to Chiron, and whispered how he had watched the snake cast his old skin and grow young again before his eyes, and how he had gone down into a village in the vale, and cured a dying man with a herb which he had seen a sick goat eat. And Chiron smiled, and said, To each Athenian Apollo gives some gift, and each is worthy in his place. But to this child they have given an honor beyond all honors, to cure while others kill. Then the lads brought in wood, and split it, and lighted a blazing fire, and others skinned the deer and quartered them, and set them to roast before the fire. And while the venison was cooking, they bathed in the snow torrent, and washed away the dust and sweat. And then all ate, till they could eat no more, for they had tasted nothing since the dawn, and drank of the clear spring water, for wine is not fit for growing lads. And when the remnants were put away, they all lay down upon the skins and leaves about the fire, and each took the lyre in turn, and sang and played with all his heart. And after a while they all went out to a plot of grass at the cave's mouth, and there they boxed and ran and wrestled and laughed till the stones fell from the cliffs. Then Chiron took his lyre, and all the lads joined hands, and as he played, they danced to his measure, in and out, and round and round. There they danced, hand in hand, till the night fell over land and sea, while the black glen shone with their broad white limbs, and the gleam of their golden hair. And the lad danced with them, delighted, and then slept a wholesome sleep, upon fragrant leaves of bay and myrtle, and marjoram, and flowers of thyme, and rose at the dawn, and bathed in the torrent, and became a schoolfellow to the hero's sons, and forgot Iolcus, and his father, and all his former life. But he grew strong, and brave, and cunning upon the pleasant downs of Pelion, in the keen, hungry mountain air, and he learnt to wrestle, and to box, and to hunt, and to play upon the harp. And next he learnt to ride, for old Chiron used to mount him on his back, and he learnt the virtues of all herbs, and how to cure all wounds. And Chiron called him Jason the Healer, and that is his name until this day. End of section 16 Recording by David Martin